So here's the agenda for this morning. Talk a little bit about the 18.2 standard that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Then talk through the seven-step process with PAS that is developed to implement the standard, as well as talk about some of the alarm system performance targets so that as you listen to the call, you can benchmark kind of industry expectations of what the uh, well-performing alarm system would look like. So with that, if we go to the, the next slide, it talks about the 18.2 standard. In uh, 2003, ISA began developing an alarm management standard. This, uh, this was done by dozens of contributors from a variety of industries, and they spent uh, literally thousands of hours participating in the development of this standard. PES volunteered and participated both as a section editor and a voting member of this standard. After about six years of development, and in 2009, that was, uh, standard was released. It's now uh, accessible via the ISA website. That's uh, www.isa.org. You know, the basic intent of uh, 18.2 is to improve safety. Ineffective alarm systems have uh, often been documented as contributing factors in major process incidents. The alarm problems that 18.2 addresses have been well known in industry for a number of decades. As these standards are developed, intentionally describe minimum acceptable standards and not necessarily optimum standards. By design, they focus on the what to do rather than the how to implement. ISA does not contain specific proven methodologies or detailed work practices. The standard focuses both uh, work pra on work process requirements, these are the shalls in, in the standard, and recommendations, which are the should, for effective alarm management. We'll cover the shalls a little bit later in the presentation. If we look at uh, ISA and how does it apply to you, I think in the short answer, the answer is yes. Uh, the focus of 18.2 is on alarm systems that are part of modern control systems, such as a DCS or SCADA. PLCs or even, even separate uh, safety instrumented systems. It applies to plants with operators that respond to alarms depicted on computer type screens or enunciators. Specifically, this includes the bulk of all processing industries, anywhere from petrochemical to refining to spec specialty chemical pipelines, power, pharma, uh, mining and metals, so it's really all over the, all over the industry. Additionally, it applies to different modes of operation. So whether your process is continuous or batch or semi-batch, the ISA 18.2 applies. This is really because this is a function of specific people interacting with computers as opposed to the process that you're necessarily involved in controlling. So it's, it's really a human factors issue. So that's why it has such broad applicability. As far as the regulatory impact of 18.2, the important thing here to understand is that the regulatory agencies have a general duty clause and in interpretations. As example, if you if you look at OSHA 1910-119, um, one subsection D32 uh, would state that the employer shall document equipment complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. This acronym is called REGAGAP, uh, and, and REGAGAP, and that is that is used extensively. So, so there's little question um, whether 18.2 is an is an example of REGAGAP. It really does, and, and a company should expect the regulatory agencies to take notice. Uh, generally, a, a regulated industry. Uh, can be expected either to comply with REGAGAP or explain that they're doing something just as good as better. So it's really a minimum uh, performance uh, expectation. And you know, indeed, uh, OSHA has sought and received permission from ISA to internally distribute 18.2 to its inspectors. Um, this was as, this was done with the specific intent to be able to easily cite its investigations um, and for enforcement. So it's, uh, you can expect to see it quite widely. Here are some examples of, of regulatory impact. Um, it, it applies all over the industry, both um, IEC is, is moving this to a global standard. FEMSA, which um, is in the pipeline management system, is aggressively pursuing 
the adoption of uh, API 1167. So that is, uh, that is a, a huge issue these days in pipeline industry. Um, and, and at the bottom of the slide here, you can see a few uh, special emphasis findings uh, from the, from the uh, OSHA that cites Regagap as in, in citations. Here's an example of some of the human factors issues um, that have to do with uh, being cited in, in Chemical Safety Board um, incidents. Basically, that the, the human factors around the alarm systems and the DCS interface are absolutely uh, critical, and you can be expected uh, for inspectors in incident investigations to routinely look for these. So as far as the FDA and where is the FDA with, um, with 18.2, um, the federal agencies were advised to incorporate these standards back in 1998, and, and the FDA, as one of those agencies, has, has uh, marched down that path. So the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry in the current good manufacturing practices, the, the CGMP, addresses, um, addresses abnormal situations. Those are really show, that's shown on the next slide as a current good manufacturing process. They're fundamental um, in the pharma industry. Uh, the CGMPs require abnormal situations to be identified and followed up on, but they don't necessarily specify that the use of alarms to identify those abnormal situations, but they do have to be followed up on. If alarms are used to identify those abnormal situations, then their regulatory ex, um, expectations on how those alarms are, are being used in the auditing. So um, that would lead you back to 18.2. This is an example of a uh, very unfortunate incident that happened a number of years ago. You, you may be familiar with it. It has to do with the uh, the uh, Texas City ISOM explosion where there were a number of fatalities. Um, the alarm system handling uh, was specifically cited in, in, the, uh, in the document and in investigation of this. And uh, this is another example of OSHA using uh, Regagap as a, uh, as a reference and how, how it links to the ISA standards. If we go on a high level, what, what an alarm is, if you look at 18.2, a lot of work was done to figure out what an alarm actually was and very carefully craft that definition. So it's really an audible or visible means of indicating the operator of an equipment malfunction, process deviation, or abnormal operator condition, and the key is requiring a response. So in many cases, Alarms in industry, legacy alarms were called alarms, but they were really informational messages that really didn't require an operator response. Here, alarms are specifically defined to something that requires an operator response. So there's confusion in industry over terms, so we try and use the term alarm very, very specifically. That would lead us to the to the PAS seven steps. In, in 2006, PAS published a book. It's called the Alarm Management Handbook. It's you know, available on Amazon and such, which provided a proven seven-step methodology for solving an alarm system problem and accomplishing effective alarm management. There's really no conflict between this seven-step approach and the 18.2 life cycle methodology. They are really the same. I mean, what the PAS seven steps are that are shown here and that will be followed up on in subsequent webinars marry both the what needs to be done with the how to, to implement a highly performing uh, optimized alarm system. So if you look at, at the next slide that has to do with the 18.2 life cycle stages, you can see these are the stages that life of an alarm system from coming up with an initial philosophy all the way through to audit management of change in, in the long-term operation of the alarms. You know, this is basically a requirements and document structure. It's, it's not an efficient system to go through and actually do an, what we would call an alarm rationalization and create, the, uh, create a highly performing alarm system. That's what the seven-step process helps lead you to do using 
the 18.2 requirements to implement that system. I can transition into the actual mandatory pieces of 18.2. These are the shall elements that um, are required. So this is an extraction of those elements from 18.2. Starts out with an alarm philosophy. This is where we have to define the responsibilities and the criteria for creating alarms and then the basis for a prioritization system. In many cases, there may be three or four priorities uh, that alarms have, and so that all needs to be defined and laid out in a philosophy document. The heavy lifting of, of the alarm work really comes in this next step, which is alarm rationalization, and that is, is where you go through each alarm by type and priority and determine the set point, the consequences, the the cause of the alarm and the corrective actions to really t to lead the operator into the critical piece, which is when the alarm goes off, what actions do I need, does he need to take? Other components of the, of the shall parts of 18.2 have to do with training. Just as in, as in OSHA um, 1910, there is operator training that has to occur um, so people are aware of the alarms and they're trained in how to respond. The next slide will cover some additional shell elements. These have to do with the testing requirements. So what does it take to test the alarm system and how often is that done? How are alarms depicted on the HMI, that, that's the human machine interface? Are there provisions for shelving? Shelving is a specifically defined term that tells you how to take an alarm out of service to not flood the operator with alarms. The performance requirements, these are the targets as far as what an alarm system should be performing against in terms of a well-managed alarm system. And of course, an MOC process for handling both changing the alarm settings and in cases of disabling those and how do you document that. The next slide will we'll dig into the alarm system performance targets. If you look at these in terms of alarms per day per operator, it will show you how kind of benchmark you in terms of what a, a well-performing alarm system is. So I won't go through all of the slides but or all of the, the values, but if you look at on the third line there, it's as far as enunciated alarms per controller position, this is in reference to a, a pipeline industry where the, a, an operator in a petrochemical plant is equivalent to a controller in, in, a, uh, in a FINSA or in a pipeline business. That's about 150 alarms per day per controller or per operator. So you can start to look at what that is and sense, you know, I, I typically use a rule of thumb here. If, a, if an operator is, is running a 12-hour shift, that's about, you know, that's about 10 alarms per hour. So it's, it's, it, it's a fairly silent control room, which is a which is uh, not a lot of alarm. So you can recognize when you walk into a control room like that because you'll, it tends to be very quiet, very calm type of a control room. There are a number of other definitions in here and performance targets that will be expanded upon in subsequent webinars. If we look at just a couple other aspects of 18.2, the next slide will introduce a couple of concepts just kind of for your awareness very quickly. One is alarm system classification. And this is, is not a prioritization system. So this is not the emergency high, low type of alarm priority that you may typically be used to. But it has, it's more of an administrative function in terms of keeping track of alarms. So things that, uh, you know, for alarms, for example, how often do you have to do refresher training? So those are the types of things that an alarm classification system is. At PAS, we recommend keeping it very simple um, and not having you know, a very elaborate uh, classification system. Essentially, there are no specific required classifications in 18.2, nor are there any minimum number of classifications that need to be defined. It's really that if you elect to have a classification, this is, um, it outlines requirements for managing that. The next slide will take that one step further, and these have to do with highly managed alarms. There is a 18.2 specifically cites these out. There's no requirement to have these alarms in any class, 
So it's not a requirement to actually have them, but if you do designate them, there are some very uh, prescriptive things that need to be done. VAS recommends as if you do have a few very important alarms, you might want to call them, set up a separate class, but not necessarily call them highly managed alarms because that brings with it some other requirements. Here's kind of the punchline. We'd like to hope help people avoid getting to know Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith. Um, I know they're only there to help you, but uh, we'd like we'd like to help you avoid having to know them really well. So in summary, poorly performing systems are widely understood and in, in, in industry it's known as a contributing factor to many accidents and poor operating. And what 18.2 defining the, the what and the alarm management handbook defining the how to implement 18.2 can really do some alarm system management and really help create a very highly performing alarm system and, and guide the operators to effective use of that alarm system. The operator UI or the HMI is, is also very important. We don't have time to dwell upon that in this, in this introductory webinar, but how the information is presented is also extremely important. So the next steps from here, this is the last slide in the presentation. I'll remind everyone at the top of your screen, there'll be a little Q&A bar where you can type a question in, and then folks at Novatech can see that question, and we can uh, spend the next few minutes doing a Q&A. As Gene had mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, Kevin's contact information is shown below here. And what we'd like to do is you know, either a complimentary analysis of your alarm system history files to look at what may be going on. Certainly Novatech and PAS are welcome to do an on-site demo of the, uh, the joint solution that's been developed. And also there's a white paper that's available that if, we, uh, if you contact uh, Kevin, he can certainly get to you. So with that, I, I think we'll open it up for any questions. And I think the, the best way to do that would be turn it over to Gene to see if, uh, what questions have come in. We did get a question on whether these slides would be available or could be mailed out, and instead what we're doing is we're actually recording this webinar series, and they will all be available from the Novatech website. So if you wait a few hours or days, we'll have this, uh, this webinar and all the subsequent webinars posted on the website. Okay. And another question is, can I use the PSS tools on both DCS and PLC systems and the answer is that yes, you can. We do have it integrated with the D3 to be able to analyze alarm history files and the configuration to come up with the analytical reports on alarm management, but those same tools have been applied to Honeywell systems, Ovation, and various uh, PLC systems. So this is not just something that you can use with the D3, although we are um, integrating it in to a certain extent with the D3. If, if anyone had any other questions, if you had submitted them, we're just gonna wrap up then. Okay, the, the, next, the next webinar is going to be at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, February 29th, and it's going to cover the first three steps of that seven-step alarm management process. And as I said, the um, links to the recordings of the webinars are going to be available on the, on the website, and also information about the, the series of webinars is there on the Novatech, Novatech process website. So thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to continuing this webinar series with you in the future.